Um, I'm neither a, a historian uh, nor am I a political scientist. Uh, I am, however, a uh, fellow at the Canadian Defence and Foreign Affairs Institute, uh, which I hope kind of gives me a, a certain veneer or sense of uh, intellectual uh, cover. My remarks uh, will be personal and certainly from the perspective of a practitioner, both as a soldier uh, who literally served in the trenches and later as a diplomat uh, whose weapon uh, became a pen. So what I propose to do over the next uh, perhaps 45 minutes or so, I'm, I really want uh, lots of time for a, a good exchange and conversation afterwards. But what I propose to do is uh, to begin at the end, <coughs> to begin uh, with the end of the Cold War and the euphoria uh, that <coughs> many of us felt uh, with the demise of the Berlin Wall and certainly thereafter the fall of the Soviet Empire. I'm then going to go back to the beginnings of the Cold War and discuss the role of nuclear weapons, the issue of uh, nuclear uh, deterrence, and certainly um, something that is scary and continues to be so is the relentless march of the associated technology. I then am going to comment on uh, the geopolitics and the international security situation uh, that political decision makers and their military advisors had to, had to face. And finally, I want to conclude uh, by making a few personal comments about the security situation that we find ourselves in now, which I personally believe is much more complicated uh, than at the height of the Cold War. And I certainly bear in mind uh, George Santayana's comment that, quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned uh, to repeat it. So again, and afterwards I'll be delighted, I guess we'll have about an hour or yes. so to, uh, uh, unless there aren't any questions, that's always possible. And uh, I, don't, I don't take it as a personal insult if somebody stomps out uh, in the middle of my uh, presentation. I won't, won't take it personally. But I'll certainly try to, if there are questions, to uh, address, um, try to address them. So, the end of the Cold War. I was serving at NATO at the time at the Canadian delegation when uh, the Berlin Wall came down in November uh, 9th, 1989. And it caught Sovietologists, it caught Western uh, politicians, NATO military planners, the intelligence communities, and indeed uh, the Warsaw Pact allies and friends of the Soviet Union totally by surprise. I then went off to Hanoi and kind of commiserated with my Vietnamese colleagues and kind of said, hey, you guys didn't see uh, the fall of the Soviet uh, Union coming. If it makes you feel any better, either did we. Um, certainly, uh, soon thereafter, uh, the Soviet Empire uh, unraveled and fell. Uh, at NATO, after a, slog, a tough slog of uh, some 40 years of often nasty confrontation, there was truly a sense of euphoria. It was like, hey, we won the Cold War. Champagne, French champagne. Uh, and it, there was certainly a cry of, um, of relief. This euphoria lasted for about two weeks. And suddenly the reality uh, set in. The world had just become a much more complicated place. Bad guys uh, in black hats, good guys in white hats were no longer. Strategic predictability and the established rules of the military game uh, had suddenly all disappeared. Now, even the benefits of uh, the so-called peace dividend 
uh, whereby nations could now spend less on uh, defense never seem to materialize. And certainly we are still dealing with the aftershocks of the Soviet Union's uh, collapse uh, from things like the breakup of Yugoslavia, uh, the challenges of the Balkans, including the fallout from ethnic cleansing, uh, to the what I call the accordion effect of speeding from a bipolar world to a unipolar world and then now to uh, perhaps something that could be again described as a multipolar world, including, of course, the resurgence of a rather aggressive uh, Russia. Now let me go back uh, to the beginning of the Cold War. Nazi Germany had been defeated. Berlin lay in waste, soon to be uh, divided into four sectors, and of course Germany divided into East and West. Japan sur surrendered, uh, but only after the nuclear devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and also the Soviet Union's uh, declaration <coughs> of war. There's still controversy. H historians will say, hey, they, uh, uh, Japan surrendered because of the atomic uh, weapons used on them, Others will uh, say, no, no, it's been the invasion of Manchuria uh, by Soviet uh, forces. Leave that to the historians. But of course, one of uh, the war's victors, the Soviet Union, added the, uh, the Baltic states, several northern island, islands uh, from uh, Japan and some Finnish territory to its empire, and uh, certainly established a swath of client states, shall we call them, uh, through Eastern Europe. These actions uh, gave rise to Winston Churchill's comment that, quote, from Stetten in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Uh, he was writing to Prime Minister Truman uh, at that time in 1945. When Igor Guzenko, the cipher clerk of the Soviet embassy in Ottawa, uh, defected um, after some comedy of error, actually, uh, on September the 5th, 1945, the documents he took with him uh, revealed Stalin's uh, efforts to steal U.S. nuclear weapon uh, secrets. They also revealed an extensive, um, the existence of an extensive uh, Soviet spy network in North America. But it was George F. Keenan, a minister and then later he became ambassador at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, uh, who wrote the famous, quote, the long telegram, February 22nd, 1946. Uh, and it described, George Keenan described the nature of uh, Soviet communist, uh, communist intentions and suggested what then became the famous policy of containment. And uh, not much later after that, he actually wrote uh, an article in Foreign Affairs, uh, used uh, the authorship of X to provide a, a more public uh, statement with respect to Again, the nature of the Soviet Union, and remember at that time, Stalin uh, was still, uh, still there, and the Gulag Archipelago was working really, really well. And uh, again, getting the public to think about what uh, to do in terms of containing uh, this, uh, this fairly aggressive entity. The, uh, the Cold War, of course, had started in earnest. Uh, the potential game changer, though, was the existence of nuclear weapons. During World War II, Allies, of course, had feared uh, that uh, Nazi Germany would uh, develop a nuclear weapon to go along with their B-1 and B-2 uh, rockets, and certainly perhaps uh, uh, German um, uh, nuclear development was a spur to uh, the Manhattan Project, the, the, the first nuclear uh, weapons uh, project. Um, certainly a lot of scientists who were no longer welcomed by Nazi Germany ended up 
uh, doing more than just working on a suntan in Western uh, United States as, uh, as the nuclear development began in earnest. Now, as a, an artillery officer, um, and ultimately posted to, uh, to West Germany, but uh, doing a few things before that, I was certainly taught how to kill Warsaw Pact uh, forces in quite a few different ways, including laying down artillery fire, uh, bombs, rockets, napalm, all on the enemy as they were uh, the theoretically um, uh, invading us. I was taught how to uh, survive in the high Arctic to repel a possible Soviet invasion of Canada's north. And I was also taught uh, to plan tactical nuclear strikes against advancing uh, Soviet tank formations, advancing uh, through, uh, especially there was one famous place in, in uh, West Germany, the Fulda Gap, which was a natural invasion route. So we took uh, the gunners like myself took uh, courses uh, euphemistically called nuclear target analysis. Mm. In uh, Europe, of course, NATO's planners um, looked at how, how large uh, Soviet armored formations were, backed by uh, huge, huge masses of uh, artillery and close air support, and the fact that they were deployed, mm. forward deployed, uh, in, uh, in Eastern Europe, especially in East, uh, in East Germany. Uh, our planners uh, calculated that the Warsaw Pact formations could actually reach uh, the English Channel from East Germany uh, in about six days. And they concluded that given uh, the overwhelming uh, conventional superiority of the Warsaw Pact, that the possible use of tactical nuclear weapons had to be part of any plan to stop them. Again, particularly if conventional means uh, fail. And I'm, I'm going to say this a couple of times. <clears throat> when, you, uh, when you think about the military, which I spent 12 years, um, the military is always trained uh, to think about the worst case scenario. And in actual fact, it would be irresponsible if the military didn't think that way. But of course, there are uh, serious uh, downsides in always thinking about the worst case scenario and of course, thinking about a nuclear war. Now, what was more difficult uh, to foresee and to plan for was how to contain a possible limited nuclear exchange in Europe uh, from becoming an all-out uh, strategic exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union, and later perhaps with a supporting role by the United Kingdom and uh, France. Uh, again, just think the training in worst case uh, scenarios. I'd like to comment, as an aside, a little bit about uh, the issue of total war. Um, uh, this is, of course, the mass destruction, uh, the mass murder of, uh, of civilians. And I, I would argue that uh, total war uh, has existed for many centuries. Uh, if you look at uh, the 13th century and Genghis Khan and his Mongol hordes, um, they had an interesting modus operandi. Um, when they came upon a city, as they, their empire expanded in Central Asia, when they came upon a city that, uh, uh, that actually resisted them, uh, they ultimately uh, defeated the, the city. And what they did, of course, was uh, kill all the males, and take all the females into slavery. And uh, soon uh, cities uh, quickly learned to surrender. Uh, 14th century European wars, uh, you besieged the city, and occasionally when the city eventually uh, fell, uh, the, 
the winner, the victor, would hold um, the rich for ransom and put the rest of the city population to the sword. And this seemed to be a modus operandi um, fairly regularly through several, um, several centuries in, uh, in Europe. American Civil War, 1864 to 1865, uh, General Sherman marched to the sea, and he left a swath of military and civilian uh, destruction as he went through the Carolinas and uh, Georgia. Fast forward, 1870-1871, Franco-Prussian War. Um, <clears throat> Paris was under siege, and uh, the German military uh, used heavy artillery to, to bomb uh, uh, Paris, killing lots of civilians. Uh, there are places, Place de la Madeleine, uh, one of the cathedrals, for instance, it still has all the shrapnel marks on, on, its, uh, on its walls. Um, World War II, we've had, uh, we saw the bombing of, uh, of London, the fire bombing of Dresden, the fire bombing of, uh, of Tokyo, and certainly the siege of Leningrad, for instance, that, uh, that killed per perhaps a million uh, Soviet uh, civilians during the several years of that particular siege. And certainly from a purely military perspective, the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki could have been viewed as simply another step in the extension of cold total war. But the scientists of the Manhattan Project and the Trinity test, the first atomic explosion, knew that something had changed in the extreme. A line had been crossed. Nuclear strategists, of course, uh, were to spend years arguing about the strategic benefits of counterforce, i.e. targeting uh, military assets versus counter value, a euphemism for targeting cities and holding large civilian populations uh, hostage. The US military, uh, the monopoly, on atomic weapons, of course, only lasted for about four years when the Soviet Union carried out its own uh, first atomic test in 1949. And perhaps it was not a coincidence that NATO was, uh, came into being that same year. Nuclear strategists uh, suddenly had to think about a potential aggressor who not only po possessed nuclear weapons, but also who might be willing to use them. Soon, however, there was a more ominous line that was crossed. The United States uh, tested a hydrogen bomb in 1952, and they tested it out in the South Pacific. Uh, I think in the, uh, somebody could correct me, I think it was in the Marianas Islands or the Marshall Islands, but South Pacific. And uh, what they didn't, um, predict was when that hydrogen bomb, a fusion bomb, uh, went off, uh, it actually made the entire island disappear. And the Soviet U Union uh, developed its own hydrogen bomb, the H-bomb, in 1953. And these bombs, the fusion bombs, were thousands of times more powerful than previous nuclear fissile weapons like the ones dropped on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And certainly, uh, from there on in, it was a race to build more and bigger nuclear weapons. Uh, Great Britain had already joined the race in 1952. Then came France in 1960 and uh, China in 1964. India let off its own, what they called um, a peaceful nuclear explosion, and they called it, it's a lovely name, they called it the Smiling Buddha. That happened in 1974, uh, in part uh, using Canadian nuclear technology and material. Uh, Israel allegedly uh, developed its own nuclear capability by 1979, 
And then a little bit later, after the, the end of the so-called Cold War, India and Pakistan had their nuclear spasm in 1998. And my good friends, the North Koreans, uh, uh, had their first nuclear test in uh, 2006. Uh, the Soviet Union's launch of the world's first, um, and, uh, there's, there's the Indian smiling Buddha. Um, certainly this is what uh, seemed to be happening and uh, you're going to have a separate, um, you're going to have a separate uh, lecture on nuclear non-proliferation, but I'll, I'll come back to it uh, a little bit later on. Um, the Soviet Union's launch of the first uh, satellite, Sputnik 1, in 1957 certainly was a cause of concern to the, to the West because the same technology that puts satellites into orbit is used to develop intercontinental ballistic missiles in terms of their trajectories, targeting, uh, etc. And uh, just as an aside, the idea of, uh, of an arms race, of course, uh, you will know, it's, it's not new. Uh, before World War I, of course, uh, one had uh, the naval <coughs> dreadnought uh, race uh, that, uh, that uh, certainly German, uh, the Germany uh, wanted to challenge uh, British uh, naval superiority. And, uh, and of course the Americans were doing even, even better than either of those two countries. And uh, certainly before that you could talk about spears and swords, uh, longbows and crossbows, uh, wooden ships and great armadas, uh, propeller aircraft versus jet aircraft, uh, cavalry versus tanks. And indeed my own gunner training uh, called for improved artillery that was more mobile, fired bigger rounds more quickly, more accurately, and at longer distances. And uh, this, this kind of um, uh, technical race goes on, and I'll come back to it in a few minutes. I'd like to now uh, talk a, a little bit about nuclear deterrence. Many books and many war plans, of course, have been written around the idea of nuclear deterrence. And I think the, the theory of nuclear deterrence is actually quite intuitive. Um, don't hit me. Because if you do, I'm going to hit you so hard back uh, that you're, you're going to regret ever hitting me. And so don't even bother thinking about it. And I apply this uh, theory to my younger son every time we have a snowball fight. Um, and so far, my deterrence approach has not worked. <laughs> uh, nuclear deterrence, however, does, of course, go into the ex existential level uh, that is hard, uh, truly, to contemplate. The doctrine of uh, deterrence has been refined over the years, but it still deals with deterrence. Uh, and what is in the eye of the beholder. It has gone from the threat of massive retaliation, massive annihilation, as stated by John Foster Dulles in 1954, the so-called Dulles uh, Doctrine, to possess, quote, maximum deterrent. Coincidentally, 1954, the American deployment of H-bombs. Um, to a no cities uh, doctrine uh, that was espoused by Robert McNamara of Cuban uh, missile crisis fame and then of Vietnam fame. This, uh, the no cities doctrine was, uh, uh, he expounded on it in 1962, whereby nuclear strikes would target only military targets and maybe those unfortunate civilians who happened to be living around that area. Bernard Brody, one of the fathers of nuclear strategy, put it thusly in 1965, quote, deterrence now means something as a strategic policy only when we are fairly confident that the retaliatory 
uh, instrument upon which it relies will not be called upon to function at all. In short, we expect the system to be always ready to spring while going permanently unused. Surely there is something almost unreal uh, about this. This is in Strategy in the Missile Age. Um, Brody, of course, was quite uh, prescient. Uh, in 1946, he had noted that, quote, thus far, the chief purpose of a military establishment has been to win wars. From now on, its chief purpose must be to avert them. And George uh, Keenan, uh, commented 35 years later, and uh, he said, quote, the nuclear bomb is the most useless weapon ever invented. It can be employed to no rational purpose. It is not even an effective defense against itself. Now, uh, variations, of course, of uh, nuclear deterrence have also evolved, perhaps the most important of which was uh, extended deterrence, where by, for example, the United States may use nuclear weapons in defense of not only NATO allies, uh, but also other potentially vulnerable allies, such as, for instance, South Korea or Japan. And by the way, uh, part of uh, the student's official uh, reading has been uh, David Krieger's uh, 10 serious flaws in nuclear deterrence uh, theory. Interestingly, uh, I found that the 10 flaws uh, that he raises uh, are the very issues that nuclear strategists and military planners have long identified, have seriously debated, <coughs> and continue uh, to, to do so. Uh, there is another, I found, uh, more helpful and thoughtful paper entitled Delegitimizing Nuclear Weapons, examining the validity of nuclear uh, deterrence that was produced in 2010 by the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies, uh, part of the Monterey Institute of International uh, Studies. It's it's worthwhile, and I'll be happy to uh, talk more is that about it. the uh, thing you, hand, you gave me to hand out to the students? Is yeah, and I, I had forgotten to... I had, oh, we can add that. Yeah, I blew it. I'll uh, post that. Oh, okay, great. And the doctrine, of course, of nuclear deterrence uh, also depends on, upon a scenario that enough nuclear forces will survive even a preemptive nuclear strike against them. And hence, uh, the development of uh, what is called the triad of, uh, of weapon systems. Now, the march of technology and uh, the nuclear triad. The first nuclear de the delivery uh, vehicles were aircraft. Uh, strategic bombers could carry a large nuclear payload, be directed at, to changing targets, and uh, if, a, if the crisis passed, um, they could be recalled uh, before they delivered their nuclear strike. Except, of course, the one in Dr. Strangelove, uh, the bomber that caused totally annihilation of the world. Uh, smaller aircraft uh, could deliver tactical strikes in more limited theaters of war. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, strategic bombers and tactical uh, strike aircraft uh, are always vulnerable to interception, either by other aircraft or by air defense uh, systems. Separately, as nuclear devices became smaller, artillery and rockets could deliver tactical nuclear strikes. And the rockets were free uh, flight rockets i.e. you fired it and there was no way you could uh, uh, do anything about it afterwards. And then of course missiles, uh, part of the technology, uh, they just became uh, much more accurate, etc. cetera. Um, ICBMs, of course, intercontinental ballistic missiles were developed uh, to strike strategic targets thousands of miles away. But they were also, and continue to be, vulnerable uh, because they're housed in static and easily targeted uh, locations. 
nuclear planners, of course, had now to deal with the problem of use them or lose them in a case of a possible preemptive nuclear strike. Of course, the answer to the issues of uh, the air or and the land-based uh, uh, components was to go to the sea with, uh, with submarines, uh, that are, which is the third component of the triad, uh, where, again, they would be much harder to find and equally lethal, the, the run silent, run deep uh, approach. The entire idea, of course, is that if one uh, component of your nuclear triad fails, you can still rely on the other's components to deliver the retaliatory strike. Now, technology marched on. Uh, both the nuclear warheads themselves and the means of delivery have undergone decades of technical refinement. So nuclear explosive devices, for instance, have become smaller and more lethal, and of course, more of them could fit into the nose cone of, uh, for instance, uh, a, a, an ICBM. Uh, they could even be programmed uh, now uh, to, um, to deliver the required um, level of explosive yield. It's like customizing your, uh, your weapon system. And of course there are stealth bombers, uh, ICBMs became faster, more accurate, more widely uh, because they're now capable of deploying decoys along with the real uh, warheads. And of course, uh, to overcome the static uh, vulnerability, mobile ICBMs uh, have been developed, and this is where the MX Peacekeeper came in. You actually put them on a railway system and let them <coughs> get along in the hope that the Soviets would miss it. Uh, etc. or they couldn't really find it. Put others on, uh, on uh, trucks, etc. Large trucks, but nevertheless. Uh, but uh, th these type of ICBMs were never uh, deployed. And of course, multi-warhead submarine-launched uh, ballistic missiles can be now uh, launched with great accuracy from Trident submarines that dive deeper and run more silently. The march of technology has also meant uh, better and less vulnerable communication systems, better national technical means, including satellite uh, systems and a global system to detect underground nuclear explosions and uh, truly keep an eye on an enemy, uh, on the enemy's nuclear forces and to ensure that nuclear arms control agreements are not broken. Uh, the nuclear explosive devices themselves, of course, have become more impervious to accidental explosion. And certainly there has been a lot of talk, including in the Senate, uh, the Canadian Senate just uh, about six months ago, about uh, the development of ballistic missile defenses. It's something that, uh, uh, of course, Ronald Reagan Strategic Defense Review, uh, the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, Star Wars um, initiated to a certain extent, but uh, the, the ideas and the, the technical discussions actually started in uh, at least as early as, uh, as the mid-60s. And, and uh, of course, there's still considerable distrust and questions about technical capacity of a, of a defensive system. And to be sure, um, all such technical advances are designed by humans and I think therefore vulnerable to human error. I'd like to uh, briefly talk about the geopolitics of the Cold War. Uh, one can describe the Cold War, of course, as a clash of ideologies between democratic cap capitalism and communist internationalism. Certainly the Cold War could be characterized as uh, hostile relations and even intense rivalry between the West and the Soviet Union. Uh, Soviet uh, Premier Nikita Khrushchev, of course, famously said to the West, actually to the Swedes, uh, we will bury you. 
Uh, but both sides pursued uh, this rivalry short of a real all-out war. And arguably the objective of both sides as rational players. And that's an important part, the rationality of, uh, of uh, playing nuclear weapons was to avoid a thermonuclear war and to prevent uh, World War III. This did not mean, however, that uh, there were no hot wars during that time, and crises. And of course, uh, uh, an example is uh, the Korean War, 1950 to 53, which is still not over. There's been no peace treaty. It's just uh, uh, an armistice that's in place. Of course, next week uh, you're going to discuss the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. NATO political decision makers and military planners, of course, saw a Soviet Union that maintained hegemony over Eastern Europe, uh, certainly by not hesitating to use military force to keep them down and keep them in. And uh, you have to think of uh, Germany in 1953, for instance, uh, the Hungarian um, Revolution in 1956 uh, that was also put down by Soviet uh, tanks uh, with the Warsaw Pact, uh, Czechoslovakia, the Prague Spring of 1967, again, uh, put down when uh, people started to think a little bit more about, uh, about freedom. And uh, the Soviet Union, of course, military forces uh, went into Afghanistan in 1980, and uh, only after many years of fighting were they forced out by the Mujahideen. Um, and one should also remember uh, the Berlin Crisis of 19. 61 in the building of the Berlin Wall. Uh, Europe, of course, was not uh, the only focus of uh, rivalry and insecurity. Mao Zedong, of course, uh, in 1949 had uh, established the People's Republic of China and was soon exporting revolution into Southeast Asia. Uh, there was and with that came the talk of the bamboo curtain. Uh, and after the defeat of the French in uh, Dien Bien Phu in North, uh, North Vietnam in 54, and the establishment of a communist regime in North uh, Vietnam, the US went on to create the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, like, uh, like NATO, <laughs> but different. And, uh, uh, again, CETO uh, ultimately fell apart as uh, the U.S. got uh, bogged down further and further in uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, the fall of Laos uh, to the Patet Lao and the fall of Cambodia to the Khmer Rouge fed what was called the domino theory of communist regime change by force. And indeed, uh, nuclear China continued to support communist insurgencies in Southeast Asia into the 1980s. At the time I was in, um, in uh, Thailand and looking at, uh, so, at uh, Chinese uh, weapons that were captured. Uh, in the Americas, contrary to the, uh, to the Monroe uh, Doctrine, Fidel Castro, of course, was in uh, power in Cuba by 1959, and his golfing partner, Che Guevara, uh, was busy exporting Marxist-Leninist revolution to Central and South America. Uh, in Africa, of course, uh, newly decolonized uh, states were being courted by both the Soviet Union and China with mega projects like dams and railways and uh, weapon systems. Uh, and of course, the Americans were, were there too, including the CIA. Uh, but uh, uh, it's no wonder that America, Western democracies, of course, were feeling a little bit pressed at the time and defensive in most parts of the world. Uh, superiority in nuclear weapons perhaps was a bit of an insurance policy. Um, who knows? The historians uh, continue to, to argue about that. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about uh, <coughs> the Canadians and uh, the Cold War uh, in terms of uh, nuclear 
uh, technology and weapons. Canada, of course, was a willing participant in the Manhattan Project uh, and extracted and processed uranium uh, for use in U.S. nuclear facilities. And this was not uh, nuclear electrical power generation. Uh, Canada was also involved in research to produce and extract plutonium as part of that same uh, project. Indeed, Canada continued to be a supplier of uranium for military purposes for about two decades after the war. And there's a lovely short um, uh, brochure that's been put out by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Com Commission back in 2012, Canada's historic role in developing nuclear weapons. Uh, Canada, of course, signed the North American Air, and then it became Aerospace uh, Defense Command uh, Agreement, NORAD, in 1957. Uh, Canada was host to early warning systems of, uh, of radars, uh, both the Pine Tree Line and then later the distant early warning a line of radars in the, in the Canadian North to detect bombers, Soviet bombers, uh, coming over the, uh, the North Pole. And from 1963 to 2006, North Bay was the site of the underground complex, as they called it. It was an alternate Nor uh, NORAD uh, headquarters, actually. In 1983, Prime Minister Trudeau agreed that the U.S. could test air-launched cruise missiles in the Canadian North. At the same time, of course, he launched his peace initiative in 1983, uh, whereby he encouraged a strategy of suffocation against nuclear weapons, missile material, and their uh, testing. From, this, from about the 1960s to mid-1980, uh, Canada also actually possessed nuclear weapons, all under the custodianship of uh, the U.S., but nevertheless, uh, nuclear weapons were deployed in Canada. Uh, these included nuclear-tipped uh, Bomark air defense missiles, uh, nuclear genie rockets uh, on CF-101 Voodoo's, uh, there were air interceptors, um, again, in the north. And one of my classmates, RMC classmates, um, was actually a voodoo pilot. And he said one of the scariest things that he had to do was intercept Soviet bombers at night. And what they did was when, and this stuff unfortunately it still goes on, uh, a bomber or several bombers would come over the Arctic, over the north, they would be picked up outside of Canadian or American Alaska territory, and then aircraft would be scrambled, and including my, uh, my classmate, and off you went to intercept, first of all to identify and to intercept them, and to say, hi, we're here, turn around, go away. And uh, the game of cat and mouse, uh, like I said, uh, continues. But he said what was really scary was putting in, being put on a vector, fly this way at that height, etc. And then you're flying beside a Soviet bomber, and it's pitch black. You know, you, you may have seen the photographs of uh, you know, pilots waving to each other, but when it's pitch black and you are very close to this rather big machine that may or may not have nuclear weapons on it, uh, it was it was scary. It was scary. Um, furthermore, uh, of course, uh, our were star fighters, the F-104s, based in Europe, had uh, tactical nuclear weapons. And we also had one SSM battery, one surface-to-surface -surface missile battery with Honest John uh, rockets uh, that were deployed in, um, in West Germany. By the mid-1980s, uh, Canada had been totally, had totally phased out of its uh, nuclear role. But as a member of NATO, of course, Canada continues to support NATO's nuclear uh, deterrence doctrine. I want to 
switch and talk a little bit about the Cold War and arms control. Earlier, I noted that uh, arguably the objective of both the US and USSR was to avoid thermal nuclear war and to prevent World War III. At its peak, um, the US had over 31,000 warheads. This was, uh, they hit their record in 1966. Uh, the Soviet Union had uh, peaked in 1985 with uh, 45,000 uh, nuclear warheads. And this is all uh, part of the, um, the, atomic, uh, the Bulletin of Atomic uh, Scientists, which is an excellent, excellent uh, read. Now, realizing how close they had come to a nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the U.S. and Soviet Union initiated a series of bilateral and multilateral arms control agreements, which contributed, albeit imperfect, imperfectly, uh, to bring better predictability and perhaps a sense of greater mutual uh, security. Uh, that uh, that up until then had been a an unstable and dysfunctional uh, relationship, and certainly there were bilateral and multilateral agreements uh, in place, uh, including for all five uh, nuclear uh, weapon states. <coughs> on the on the bilateral side. Um, a hotline agreement was uh, was finally put in place. We had SALT 1 and 2, the strategic arms limitation talks, then followed, then finally the, the negotiators figured out, so what are you going to do with 31,000 nuclear warheads? Yeah, build in a bit of redundancy, but that still leaves about 30,000 warheads. So, so they actually did start a process of start one and start two of uh, reduction uh, talks. Uh, and now there's supposed to be a reset uh, that has uh, gone, gone amiss. Uh, there was the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty uh, that was signed in the mid-80s. And this, this to me was really important. I, I was sitting at NATO at the time, but this tr particular treaty got rid of an entire class of extraordinarily dangerous nuclear weapons. Um, the Soviets had the SS-20, which was mobile and could hit any bit of Western Europe. And careful not to hit any bit of the United States because it's always the question of a strategic exchange. So the Soviets um, and, and these missiles were extraordinarily fast, and they were there. You could just kind of press the button, and that's it. Um, on the on the NATO side, the American side, you had uh, kind of an equivalent in terms of Pershing II missiles, mobile, fast, highly accurate, and in actual fact, probably could hit uh, Moscow, and of course, ground ground launched. Uh, uh, cruise missiles, uh, again, going low, fast, and uh, deadly. So they got rid of them. And now, of course, there are questions of whether Russia is still following that particular agreement. But it was, to my mind, an important uh, uh, agreement forward. And on the multilateral side, of course, there is a, a partial test ban uh, treaty that uh, doesn't allow tests in the atmosphere, and there's supposed to be a comprehensive test ban treaty, but it's not enforced because a few of the, what they call the core states, have yet to sign. And among the core states who have not signed are India, Pakistan, and North Korea, and there are five who have not ratified. China, Egypt, Iran, Israel, and the United States. Uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, we still have three outliers, uh, India, Pakistan, Israel, who never joined, and then of course North Korea, uh, that, uh, that did sign and walked away uh, from it. Now, if we could talk about it, uh, the, the, nuclear, the NPT review conference is coming up in April this, uh, of this year. It's 
every five, uh, five years. There's uh, a lot of challenges around it. The, uh, the other treaty that I particularly liked, maybe because I was so involved in it, uh, was the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, which started to cut back numbers of tanks, artillery, aircraft, um, both uh, on the NATO side and the Warsaw Pact side. The theory, of course, being that you ultimately could not use the excuse of overwhelming conventional power to use nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons. So if you got to the base of conventional forces, then there would be no more excuse. Uh, it hasn't quite worked out that way, and I'll talk about it in my last few minutes. Um, and of course, there are various nuclear weapon-free zone treaties covering Latin America, Africa, South Pacific, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Mongolia, and the Antarctica. The, I, I do want to switch a little bit in my last uh, few comments about, um, about uh, the post-Cold War era. And uh, please remember uh, Santayana's um, comment. Uh, as I mentioned, I think the world is much more complicated now than it ever has been during the Cold War. And uh, let me just count uh, some, of the, some of the ways. Uh, first of all, there is an aggressive Russia um, post its war in Georgia. Uh, you're all aware of what is happening in, uh, in uh, Ukraine and uh, the Crimea. There are certainly Russian uh, Arctic ambitions as they open up more military or reopen their military bases in the, in the Arctic. And of course, they have deployed, um, but just on a temporary basis and brought them back, uh, nuclear capable missiles in Kaliningrad, uh, which is a small piece of territory between Poland and Lithuania that, uh, that has, uh, that uh, hosts, uh, uh, the Russian Baltic fleet and uh, is, is, from a geographic point of view, uh, uh, an interesting challenge. Arguably, the United States is in decline. It's no longer the world's policeman, and of course it has challenges, serious challenges, both in foreign policy and in defense uh, policy. Uh, we still have the potential of nuclear conflict in India, Pakistan. India has about uh, 90 to 110 nuclear weapons, uh, Pakistan 100 to 120. There's a lot of questions about Pakistani, the security of Pakistan nuclear forces. And uh, India and Pakistan continue uh, serious rivalry over Afghanistan. Uh, and we don't know where Afghanistan is uh, going to go. And of course, the local, the, there is a local arms race aided by Russia, uh, Russia for the Indians, China for the Pakistanis, and U.S. more of late uh, for, uh, for India. Uh, Middle East instability, there's a question of a nuclear Iran. Uh, everybody, um, I think, uh, the, the uh, the strategists, uh, the military planners do believe that, uh, that Israel um, has nuclear weapons. There's always uh, an interesting ambiguity about that, that uh, Israel uh, maintains. There's Syria, there's Iraq. Uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention um, has not been signed by Egypt, and it has been signed by Israel, but it has not been ratified, chemical weapons a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, Biological Weapons Convention, it, uh, it has not been signed by Israel, but Egypt signed but not ratified. And they kind of hold each other for ransom as the bigger game of nuclear uh, issues is, uh, is out there. And of course, there's Palestine, Palestinian issues. The 2010 
NPT review conference uh, promised that there would be a Middle East conference on weapons of mass destruction uh, by 2012. It hasn't happened yet. And I think that's going to be really problematic uh, for come, uh, come April. <coughs> uh, we do, of course, have a emerging uh, China as its economic power grows. It's, uh, there's, uh, they have about 250 nuclear weapons. And I'm, and I'm quoting uh, the, uh, the nuclear scientist's uh, bulletin for these uh, approximations. But there's a heck of a lot of uncertainty with respect to what China wants to do in the South China Sea and also in the East China Sea, or the Sea of Japan. And of course, there's huge military modernization going on, including their first aircraft uh, carrier that, they're, uh, that they bought originally from Ukraine. And then there's North Korea. Uh, happy to talk about North Korea. I've been in Pyongyang. I've been there four times. It's a scary place. It's a, what I consider a rogue, failing state with nuclear weapons. And there's a possibility that they may have up to 10. And so in terms of when you're talking rationality, uh, that's the most irrational place that I've uh, have been to. Um, there's terrorism, there's, I already mentioned, the ballistic missile uh, defense issue. Uh, is it a stabilizing system that will uh, deny an Iranian strike or a North Korean strike, or is it a strategic destabilizer as uh, the Russians and the Chinese maintain? It's a question I mentioned of whether Russia uh, broke the INF Treaty. There's the modernization of nuclear forces. There was a recent U.S. Congressional Budget Office estimate that the U.S. will spend $348 billion to maintain and upgrade its nuclear arsenal. And of course, the Russians are doing the same thing. Military doctrines, it's something that I've uh, been looking at fairly seriously. I've, uh, I've said that uh, military generals are trained to deal with worst case scenarios, <laughs> and uh, if they didn't, uh, they would be considered irresponsible. But such an approach, uh, I think, inhibits uh, what I consider uh, positive lateral thinking. NATO's doctrine, current, uh, quote, def deterrence based on an appropriate mix of nuclear and conventional capabilities remains a core element of our overall strategy. The circumstances in which any use of nuclear weapons might be, might have to be contemplated is extremely remote, but as long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. And right now, the estimate is the U.S. has something like 4,760 warheads in their military stockpile and about 2,500 warheads waiting to be dismantled. France, 300 warheads, and they're not dismantling any. Uh, United Kingdom, 225. Again, bulletin source, bulletin of atomic scientists. Russia's military doctrine uh, was, a new one was produced in February of 2010. And it was modified last month in uh, December. And uh, I'm still looking for an official translation of the whole thing. Uh, but essentially, the 2010 version said that the use of nuclear weapons can happen in extreme circumstances or against overwhelming NATO conventional forces. Yeah, Canada, Liechtenstein, no, Luxembourg and Italy are going to attack uh, Russia. So there's a, it's a bit of a disingenuous uh, uh, statement, but uh, on the other hand, that's exactly what NATO said about their tactical nuclear weapons against over force, uh, overwhelming uh, Soviet uh, forces, conventional forces. The, um, so the 2014 update, uh, December, uh, states that NATO remains the primary external risk and uh, they'll retaliate against any nuclear attack. Um, 
and also they will strike, uh, they will use nukes if an existential threat is posed by conventional forces. But now it, it also um, includes this new notion of non-nuclear deterrence. It's uh, something I'll come back to in my last few minutes. Sorry it's taking so long. Okay, you're doing great. Keep <laughs> going. Oh. Well, but there won't be any questions afterwards, oh, which yes, is really will. good. No. <laughs> we, uh, uh, it's estimated that, uh, that uh, Russia has about 4,300 operational nuclear weapons and that there's about 3,700 uh, waiting to be dismantled. Chinese military doctrine, they uh, just uh, fairly recently actually published a, a, uh, a public doctrine about their military you know, kind of strategic outlook. <coughs> it doesn't say anything. And uh, it's one of the biggest uh, sort of opaque uh, challenges for those of us who follow security matters in, uh, in Asia. Uh, but China has reiterated uh, many times over that it would never be the first to use nuclear weapons. And of course, the United Kingdom and France uh, maintain their, quote, minimum deterrence. And uh, there's, there's always, in my mind, speculation, like, why do, you want, why do you need nuclear weapons? Well, they used to be the great colonial powers, of course, and I think there's that, that uh, the great nationalism and, uh, and perhaps nostalgia for for um, empires lost, but they also, I think, use uh, the possession of nuclear weapons to reinforce the fact that they are permanent members of the Security Council. So again, important, important uh, element. The um, future of deterrence. <laughs> Uh, deterrence remains, as I mentioned before, the, in the eye of the beholder, uh, but I, I really truly do question the military utility of nuclear weapons. I think it's marginal at best. Uh, the, the scary thing that is happening is that conventional arms uh, are becoming so precise, so destructive, that they can actually uh, replace the use of nuclear weapons. Certainly at the tactical side, uh, many of the theoretical uh, nuclear tactical targets now can be, um, can be taken out uh, by conventional weapons. And that was already shown uh, by the United States uh, bombing of uh, Iraq uh, for instance, twice over the shock and awe of uh, conventional uh, weapons, uh, cruise missiles, taking out uh, targets really, really precisely. And uh, of course, you know, why would you want to nuke something if you can just take it over? Um, anyway, so uh, there, there's the destructive power of conventional weapons. And a, a, a good example recently is uh, uh, the testing of, quote, the massive ordnance penetrator bomb um, against, uh, which could be used against underground facilities. Iran and North Korea come to mind. But again, you don't need a nuke these days to wipe out an underground nuclear installation. Um, and also, the first operational laser weapon has been deployed at sea uh, off the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, there, there's some interesting, uh, again, I only uh, have access to uh, open material, but it's uh, what I've read is rather interesting. Uh, you can kind of go. Uh, use a dial, I suppose, on the, on the laser system to stun people on a ship, like a pirates, uh, for instance, off the Horn of Africa. Or you can crank it up and destroy the boat. Okay, now it's just, uh, no, just uh, 
new interesting technology there's uh, there's other stuff uh, coming and I, I truly believe that uh, in terms of future battlegrounds it's going to be the two spaces um, cyber it's already happening and of course outer space I, I do believe that there is a danger of uh, the militarization of outer uh, space despite treaties in place there is a danger so uh, to conclude uh, I paint I haven't painted a particularly uh, pretty picture uh, and even the bulletin of atomic scientists have moved their doomsday clock ahead uh, to three minutes to midnight that they did that last uh, the, the last week and they cited the un unchecked uh, climate change, global nuclear weapons modernization, and outsi outsized nuclear arsenals for that particular change. And uh, it's something to, to think about. Uh, for the students, the young, the young gang uh, here, it's, uh, it's your world. It's, uh, it's full of, I think, uh, security and defense uh, challenges, never mind. Uh, the issues around climate change, uh, environment, health, Aboriginal issues, etc. And I hope that uh, you in the audience will get involved, uh, even go out and vote, of course, eventually uh, this year. Uh, but also, uh, I hope that you are going to be as well informed of the issues as you possibly uh, can be because there's also a lot of disinformation, misinformation, I believe hysteria out there also. And uh, just um, uh, uninformed uh, opinion. So again, I think you, you really have to uh, take the time and uh, think it through in terms of uh, uh, being uh, informed as well as uh, you can. I will stop there. I'm sorry that it's been so long. <laughs>